In your Bibles, if you would turn to that book of John chapter 6, we're going to stand and read our passage today in John chapter 6 and verse number 22 to 29. I want to talk to you today about doing the works of God. Let's stand right up. And uh, we do this. If you're our guest, welcome. This is what we do. We honor the Word of God in standing. And we read out loud together. And so the words are on the screen. Let's read beginning now. On the following day, when the people who were standing on the other side of the sea saw that there was no other boat there except the one which his disciples had entered, and that Jesus had not entered the boat with his disciples, but his disciples had gone away alone, however, other boats came from Tiberias near the place where they ate bread after the Lord had given thanks. When the people therefore saw that Jesus was not there, nor his disciples, they also got into boats and came to Capernaum seeking Jesus. And when they found him on the other side of the sea, they said to him, Rabbi, when did you come here? Jesus answered them and said, Most assuredly, I say to you, you seek me not because you saw the signs, but because you ate of the loaves and were filled. Do not labor for the food which perishes, but for the food which endures to everlasting life, which the Son of Man will give you, because God the Father has set his seal on him. And they said to him, What shall we do that we may work the works of God? Jesus answered and said to them, This is the work of God that you believe in him who he sent. Boy, you cannot get a clearer, clearer statement of what is necessary in order to please God to become the child of God than you just got when he was asked a direct question. The direct question was, what must we do to do the works of God? And he answered, this is the work of God that you believe in him who he has sent. I won't take time to talk about the care card where you can ask for prayer. I won't take time to talk about the, uh, the group ministry, but there's a kiosk because we want to get right into the passage this morning and our time is uh, limited. So let's uh, go to the Lord in prayer and ask his blessing on what we're doing this morning. Father, thank you for being with us today. I pray that you would help us as we focus in on this clear statement from your own lips, Jesus, about what is necessary. And I pray, Father, that you would help us. So add your blessing to the preaching and teaching of your word. Draw us to yourself. I pray that if there are believers here today that have been stuttering about what to share with people, I pray that the sermon would give them the ability to share their faith. On the other hand, if there are people here that have yet to come to faith in Jesus and do not know him as Savior, I pray that what is said today would draw them through your spirit to become true believers in Jesus. Thank you for this time together. We give you honor and praise in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. <clears throat> it's interesting. Verse number 22 said, on the following day. What following day is that? Well, the day before he had fed a multitude uh, with uh, a few loaves and two small fishes that night after doing that, he had walked on the water. And so now we're on the day following. We're the following day and ministry is going on and the people have come to follow him. So let me just jump into this this morning. And you've got a sheet you could take a few notes on. I want to just say, what must I do to be saved? What work is required of me? Where is the list of requirements to work my way into God's good favor so that I can get started. What thing am I missing? See, Pastor Phil, this is a Bible preaching church. Uh, we all know the answer to that. So what's the point here? Well, the truth is after many years of ministry and piles of sermons, I'm convinced that many still think salvation is the result of something a person can do personally to earn or merit salvation. People will refer to family members or friends or sons or daughters or aunts or uncles and they'll go on talking about how they were great people and they did good things. Surely they were believers. Well, folks, it's, 
It's so clear from this passage of Scripture that we don't work our way into God's good favor. We don't work our way into the family of God. It is so very, very clear. I want to say it would be a travesty to sit on the seats of a gospel preaching church and miss the message of grace that clearly rings out of the Word of God across the lips of some preacher, across the pulpit on a regular basis, only to hear this one day from Matthew 7. Many will say to me in that day, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in your name and cast out demons in your name and done many wonders in your name? And then I, Jesus speaking, I will declare to them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you who practice lawlessness. People who made assumptions but had never believed. Somebody's going to say, Pastor, you're just jumping right in this morning, aren't you? Well, what I'm doing is pointing to the conclusion of what I'm preaching about this morning from the very start. I want to say this to you this morning on the authority of God's Word. Here's what I want to say. Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and you will be saved. Call on the name of the Lord Jesus and you will be saved. Receive the Lord Jesus, believe in Him and you will become the child of God. And friends, I'd have to backslide on God and ignore the obvious teaching of today's passage not to speak like an ambassador, ambassador from the heavenly kingdom saying, please, I beg you, be reconciled to God through the grace and salvation offered to you in the person of Jesus Christ, the Son of the living God. I'd have to just completely fail God because we're preaching through the passage. The question is asked, what are the works that are necessary for me? What are the works of God? And he says, this is the work of God that you believe. So if you don't remember anything else today from the sermon, I want you to remember this phrase, believe and be saved. Believe and be saved. So after back-to-back miraculous signs, Jesus began one of his longest discourses in all of the Bible on the bread of law, the bread of life. I'm calling this section in our study life essentials. There are doctrines of first importance in the scriptures, 1 Corinthians tells us. And today's doctrine, what we're talking about, is absolutely essential. We might talk about the timing of the rapture of the church. That's important, but nailing down the timing is not essential. We may talk about the identity of the beast of the apocalypse today. But uh, figuring out that identity is not essential. But just as bread or food is essential for physical existence, Jesus presents himself as the essential bread of life that gives eternal life to everyone who receives him. The section we're looking at goes from verse 22 all the way through verse 71, but it's going to take a few weeks to unpack and unfold all of it. Now, the people who saw the miracles of his healings followed Jesus to the place where he and his disciples had retreated for rest. They were reeling from the announcement of the martyrdom of John the Baptist, and they had been very busy with arduous ministry for many days. And so Jesus led them to a location on the eastern shores of Galilee where they could get some rest and he could do some further teaching. But the crowds, they wanted to find him. You see, Jesus, it could be said, was indeed the greatest show on earth at that moment. He healed many of them. He fed all of them. And once again, he sought to get away with his disciples. Last week, we saw Jesus and his disciples. We saw where Jesus put his disciples in a little boat and then he dismissed the multitude and then he went up on a mountain to pray. We talked about the storm that the disciples encountered and how Jesus came walking on the water about, and about the immediate arrival to their destination. Today's passage, uh, but the passage today revealed the real reason that these people came scurrying across. They got into boats. They did, got there any way they could. It tells the real reason that the people were following him. They had been captivated by his miraculous healings, so they sought to see more. Their stomachs had been satisfied with the fish and the bread, and now what they really want is a lot more. Back in verse 15, they were intended to make him a king. Well, who doesn't want a king like that? Who doesn't want a king that can feed you with abundance? Who doesn't want a government that provides everything you need? And Jesus didn't want to be that kind of materialistic king, and he certainly didn't want materialistic followers. So what was the setting? You've got a scripture sheet that you picked up on the way in. I trust you'll use it as a listening guide this morning. What was the setting? Verses 22 to 25 tells us it was a setting of mystery. 
Where did he go? Where did Jesus go? They saw the disciples get in the boat, but Jesus didn't get in. They saw Jesus go up on the mountain, so maybe they laid down to rest, got up the next day, and they looked for Jesus, but they couldn't find him. So they were concerned about it. They got in those boats that came from Tiberias, and they headed for Jesus' adoptive hometown of Capernaum. They wanted to look for him. When they found him, they asked, when did you get here? How did you get here? The disciples of Jesus knew how he had got there. They had seen things and experienced things. And boy, this is a blessing of being a follower of Jesus. We have an understanding and a perception, and we've seen things and experienced things that the world just cannot understand. They had an experience with Jesus on the water that they'll never forget. The multitude saw the bread and the fish. They didn't see him walking on the water. They knew something had happened, but not what or how. They were in the dark. And I want to tell you that the whole world is in the dark today about Jesus. They don't understand him and they don't understand what has happened to Christians. They don't understand a Christian that makes it, what makes him act and live the way he does. They don't understand why we don't run with them to excesses of debauchery, indulgence of sin, sex, drugs, and rule-free living like 1 Peter 4, 3 to 4 describes. They are in the dark, but what are we called to do? We as believers are called to help open their eyes in order to turn them from darkness to light and from the power of Satan to the power of God, that they can receive the forgiveness of sins and an inheritance among all those that are sanctified by faith. Let's stop for a minute. How many of you have friends and family, co-workers? Brother Russ was talking about going where the people are, going into the workplaces, going into the neighborhoods, going. How many of you have people in your life? Maybe they're family, maybe they're friends, maybe they're acquaintances. How many of you, you really would love them to find the grace and salvation that's in Jesus and forgiveness of sins? Can you just say amen? Amen. Well, oh, we want it so very much. Guys, use the Bilderberger as an opportunity as the gospel is going to be shared. But listen, I just want to, I just want to say to you that uh, Josh Collier, I, I bless his heart. I love it. He uses this verse to bring them out of darkness into light, out of the kingdom of Satan, into the kingdom of God. He is living that purpose over in North Africa. So what were they seeking? Well, they chased him down. They got in ships. They came here. What were they seeking? Well, They were seeking someone to meet their temporary needs. Jesus saw right through them. They were talking about seeking him, but they really weren't seeking Jesus as Lord, as life, as Messiah and Son of God. They were seeking some more food. Jesus said so. They were seeking the superficial, something to fill their stomachs. They were seeking somebody to meet all of their temporary needs. And I just have to ask a question. Is this a surprise to us? It shouldn't be a surprise to us knowing the world that we live in. And it shouldn't be a surprise having read the first few chapters of John. Think about it. If you go back to the woman at the well, what was it that she wanted? Well, the first thing she wanted was not to have to come to the well anymore and lift the water out of the well. She wanted some help with that. Well, thankfully, she came to understand what Jesus was offering, and she came a believer. She wanted the everlasting water, and so she got the message. But here the subject is food. It's always been that way, going all the way back in the Old Testament, the Jews in the wilderness after they came out of Egypt. They wanted some water, and they wanted some food, and they complained and bellyached until they got just what they wanted. We want water. We want food. Well, the multitude in this story was seeking a supplier of all the material needs they had. The crowds came when Jesus was handing out bread. Now listen to me. The crowds came when Jesus was handing out bread, but as we're going to see in the future weeks, when he began teaching the spiritual and the eternal, they left in mass. They didn't want more than that physical temporary supply to be given. I can just hear one of them saying, well, he's not giving out any more bread, folks. We better look somewhere else. Let's go. Someone to meet their temporary needs and then someone to guarantee favorable circumstances. You say, what do you mean by that? Well, the underlying issue even among his disciples was the hope of a Messiah king that would overthrow the Romans and establish Israel with all the covenant blessings that they had enjoyed in the past. They wanted a king who would feed their stomachs and fight their battles. It goes all the way back to the Jews in in the Old Testament wanting a king that would supply their needs and fight their battles. They didn't want to learn the principles of the kingdom or to serve the Lord of the kingdom. What they wanted were the delights of God, but no doctrine. They wanted the blessings, but no responsibility. They wanted favorable circumstances, conditions of plenty, but no constraints on their lifestyle. 
Well, what do many modern Christians, now I talked about this, gave a hint last week. I'm going to expand it right now. What do many modern Christians want from Jesus? Well, we want conditions of plenty, favorable circumstances, and a permission slip to live any way we want without really serving the Lord's purpose at all. Little commitment, no commitment at all if possible. This whole idea of follow Jesus, follow his agenda, follow his calling, follow his example, follow his shining light to a lost world. No thanks. A little bit too holy Joe for me. Too radical. Here's what they say in essence without the words. Jesus, look here. Your job is to save me from my sin, keep me out of trouble, give me what I want, and take me to heaven when I die. I just revealed to you the number one thought I've been doing this a long time, but many people have it in their mind that this is Jesus' job. Let me read that again. Look here, Jesus, your job is to save me from my sin, keep me from trouble, give me what I want, take me to heaven when I die, and by the way, don't ask too much of me. What were they lacking? Verse 27 to 29. They were lacking spiritual hunger. They were following Jesus for what they could get from him. It was a utilitarian relationship. Ecclesiastes 6, 7. You need to jot that down somewhere. Ecclesiastes 6, 7. Listen to this. All the labor of man is for his mouth. Boy, that's, that's amazing, isn't it? All of the labor of man is for his mouth, yet the soul is not satisfied. Isaiah 55 talks about it. Why do you spend money for what is not bread and your wages for what does not satisfy? How interesting. I can't help but mention the, even among Christianity, the health, wealth, and prosperity gospel that is so popular today. In essence, it teaches that if you really believe, if you're really God's child, then you can expect good health, material riches, smooth sailing, and the guaranteed earthly benefits of being the child of God. Never mind what Jesus actually said. He said that in this world you would have tribulation. He said, if they hated me, they're going to hate you. He said, if they persecuted me, they're going to persecute you. And that sufferings can be part of God's plan, 1 Peter 4, 16 and 19. They lack something else. They lack the concept of the eternal. It was about right here, right now. Here's what they thought. Heal us, feed us, supply us, provide for us, protect us. When he said, don't labor for the things that perish, but for the things that endure, they turned him off. Now, folks, let's not be so utilitarian in our thinking. Because God has already promised us eternal life, eternal blessing, eternal reward, eternal relationship with the Father. And Ephesians says it will take eternity to unpack all of his gracious gifts to us. They lacked something else. They lacked an understanding of the concept of the word gift. When Jesus mentioned the word labor and said, labor not for food that perishes, but for food that endures, they missed the point. They immediately resorted to their theological roots of keeping the law, rule keeping, doing good things to gain God's approval. They revealed their belief system when they asked this. Look at verse number uh, number 28. Then they said to him, what shall we do that we may work the works of of God. He was talking about labor, labor for those things that endure. They said, okay, labor. Let's talk about it. What are the works of God? Maybe they were thinking something like this. This must be like the Passover. You know, we had a list for the Passover. We need to do our checklist. Think about the Passover. What would they have checked off? Well, do we have the spotless lamb? Do we have the bitter herbs, the hyssop? Have we cleaned the house? Have we gotten rid of all the leaven? Hey, honey, this is unleavened bread, right? Have we marked the doorpost, the header and the the sideboards with the blood of that lamb? Is everyone ready? Are we dressed right, loins girded, ready to run? Okay, let's all eat. Eat it up because we can't leave anything until morning. So maybe they're thinking, Jesus, that was the Passover list. You give us your list. We'll work our way. We'll, we'll, We'll work our way into your good favor. Notice in their verse number 28, they said, what are the works? Plural. Verse number 29, Jesus just gave us one work. One work. What is that work? Well, it's not a work at all. Believe. So they lacked the one work that saves. The one. Look at verse number 29. Jesus said to them, this is the work of God that you believe in him that he has said, this is what God requires of you. He requires that you believe in him who God has sent. Believe in me, trust me. (laughs) 
that word believe and trust. A few months ago, I don't think it would happen now because we've had all these benches out and brought them back in, but I was trying to illustrate trust and I said, boy, we need to trust something completely. And I jumped up on this bench where Bonnie is sitting right here and that thing wobbled with me and I said, boy, I don't want to trust this bench. But the whole point is this, is that that's, what, that's the idea, is to throw all of your weight, all of your confidence, all of your hopes, all of your past sins, present life, and future hope. Put it all on Jesus. That means believe in him. Trust him. Don't trust yourself. Don't trust your performance. Don't trust your, no, no. Believe. This is the work. What does Jesus want? This is it. Believe in him. Trust him totally, wholly. Don't believe in yourself. So incredibly important. Recognize the reason we seek Jesus is because Jesus is seeking us. Romans 3.11, nobody's seeking for God. But the Bible says also, Luke 19.10, Jesus came to seek and to save that which was lost. We're going to really see this in a few weeks in, in this book of John chapter 6. Here's what we need to do. We need to, when he draws near to us, we need to seek Jesus for the supernatural, not just the superficial. God has already promised to provide for all of our needs. He's already done that. He knows what we need. He preached a sermon called the Sermon on the Mount in Matthew 6, 25. I say to you, do not worry about your life, what you'll eat or drink, about your body, what you'll put on. And he goes on and talks about that. Don't worry about those things. 33 says, seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and all of these things will be added to you. Let me pull over and say this just for a moment. Can we, can we just stop putting Jesus on trial? Just stop taking him to task about whether he loves you and cares about you or not. God the Father is so clear. He says God proved his love to us and while we were yet sinners, what did Jesus do? He died for us. I mean, there's no greater proof of the love of God than thinking about what happened on a cruel cross on Calvary all those years ago. He died for us to take our sins away. And he promised that if he would die for us when we were sinners, how much more will he love us and care for us now that we are following him? But I want to go back to that. Let's not put Jesus on trial. Can we stop? Can we just stop this by doing this kind of thing? Can we just put a halt to saying, give me this and I'll believe? Heal this sickness, then I'll believe. Fix this, stop that, arrange that situation. Give me more, and then I'll believe. You got to stop doing that because he gave you his all. Even the disciples had a slow arrival to the full understanding at the big fish catch. Peter said, I'm unworthy. At the first calming of the storm, they said, what kind of man is this? And then when he fed the 5,000, they said, whoa, he's a prophet. But when he finally came to walking on the water and they were in the middle of the storm and there was no hope and there he was, then they said, those who were in the boat came and worshiped him saying, truly you are the son of God. Can we stop putting Jesus on trial? Second, seek Jesus for who he is and not what he has. At first they came from miracles. Later they came from materials. Jesus is not looking for followers who are along for the ride as long as there's plenty of supplies and the road is easy. He asked them to put him first, forsake their ambitions and follow him. Luke 9, 23, if anyone desires to come after me, let him deny himself, take up his cross and follow me. Seek him for who he is, not just what he has. Seek him for what he's already done, not what he's going to do next. Receive salvation as a gift, not as something you earn, verse 27. Folks, you can't work for a gift. How ludicrous it would be to get up on Christmas morning and people are exchanging gifts. And say, oh, thank you so much. Now, what, what's, what am I going to have to do now over the next 365 days to deserve and own and to keep this? Wait, wait, wait. It's a gift. We get confused when we think of God's gift of eternal life. It is so great, so gracious, so eternal, but there's nothing that we can do about that gift except receive it. Let the Word of God speak to you this morning. I'm, I'm going to read some passages right out of the Word of God that speak to this whole idea of gift, the whole idea of not laboring, the whole idea of faith. Listen to this. John 4.10, Jesus answered and said to her, if you knew the gift of God and who it is that says to you, give me a drink, you would have asked and he would have given you living water. Romans 5.15, the free gift it's not like the offense. For if by the one man's offense many died, much more the grace of God and the gift by the grace of the one man Jesus abounds to many. Romans 6, 23, we all know this one. For the wages of sin is death, but the what? Gift 
of God is eternal life. Rome, uh, Ephesians 2, 8, for by grace you have been saved through faith and that not of yourselves. It is the gift of God, not of works. And then we need to believe that the one who The one work required is this. The one work required, verse 29, this is the work of God that you believe in him who who he has sent. This is the work. The witness of the scriptures is profuse. You cannot work your way to heaven. Romans 3, 20, therefore by the deeds of the law, no flesh will be justified in his sight. Romans 3, 28, we conclude that a man is justified by faith apart from the works of the law. Galatians 2, 16, knowing that a man is not justified by the works of the law, but by faith in Jesus. Ephesians 2, 8, for by grace you have been saved through faith, and that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God, not of works. Titus 3, verse 4, when the kindness and love of God are saved. Isn't that beautiful? When the kindness, there's never been anybody more kind to you than God Almighty. By sending his son to die for you. When the kindness and love of God our Savior toward man appeared, not by works of righteousness which we have done, but according to his mercy he saved us through the washing of regeneration and renewing of the Holy Spirit whom he poured out on us abundantly through Jesus Christ our Savior. The witness of this gospel, John, we're only up through chapter 6, but it's astounding. John 1, 12, as many as received him, to them gave he power to become the son, the children of God to those who believe in his name. John 3, 15, whoever believes in him should have, should not perish, but have eternal life. John 3, 16, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. John 5, 24, most assuredly I say to you, he who hears my word and believes, listen, it's on and on and on. It goes, and what does he say in John chapter 6 and verse 20? 29, this is the work that I require that you believe in the one who the Father has sent. And I'm just at the first part of John. It's consistent all the way through this one, all the way through the epistles of John. Oh, it is so incredibly clear in the scriptures. The gospel of John, the epistles of John say it repeatedly, consistently, many more times. I'm just stopping here at the present passage. Somebody's going to say, Pastor, what in the world are you doing? You're preaching like some sort of Billy Sunday evangelist this morning. Listen to me for a moment. Just listen to me. I'm preaching through the gospel of John. And what kind of a failure would I be? What kind of an abject failure would I be to make an assumption that everybody in the room already knows Jesus? It says in verse 28, they said to him, what shall we do that we may work the works of God? Jesus answered and said, this is the work of God that you believe in him whom you have sent. I am obeying 2 Timothy chapter 4 that says I'm supposed to preach the word and do the work of an evangelist. And so I beg you, I plead with you, I implore you, examine yourself. Examine yourself to see if you be in the faith, 1 Corinthians 13, 5. And I can say this to you with all confidence from the scripture, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and you will be saved. Believe in him. Have you believed the gospel? Have you committed your past sins, your present life, and your future hopes to Jesus? Are you hearing this for the first time? Good news, you can believe today. Are you hearing this for the 400th time? Good news, it's never too late to trust Jesus. Cast off the idea of what people might say. Forget the idea of saving face and concern yourself with the saving of your soul. Do you understand this, that salvation is by grace alone, through faith alone, in Christ alone, because he did all the work. He died for you. He rose again. Do you believe this?